Okay, welcome back. Um, this <clears throat> video is going to be one in which I discuss um, the song I just recorded, which was uh, The Band Played Waltzing Matilda by Eric Bogle, um, and uh, give a little tutorial. The tutorial, again, will come at the end of the video, um, so there'll be some timestamps in the description, chapters, I believe YouTube calls them, and you can just skip right to whichever part interests you. Um, but for those of you who want to stay a while and listen, um, there's some other things I'm going to go through first. Um, such as the uh, Odyssey that was trying to record that song. Um, it, actually, learning the song itself, like trying to teach myself how to play this song on the bazooki was... Um, well, like I say, very intuitive. Uh, it it kind of came together. What happened was I had spent um, several hours. Uh, it took me a few nights. So on the first night, I had spent several hours trying to um, get the song recorded on my guitar up there. Uh, and I just wasn't happy with how it was sounding. Um, I've played it before on the guitar. Um, probably a year, maybe two years ago, um, some friends of mine asked me to uh, try to learn that song. Uh, and I did. And we played it at that time, just a jam in the living room. And it, it, it was okay. It went well. But um, I was never really in love with um, my guitar part. So on that first night of trying to record that for uh, publication on YouTube, I... Uh, I just, I, I wasn't feeling it, and so I um, picked up the bazooki and instead tried to, to learn how to play it on the bazooki. I knew the chord progression, and so, uh, you know, it was just a matter of trying to get a nice picking pattern, and I think I found it. Um, so that was pretty good. The, the playing of the song was good, the singing of the song I felt was good, um, but... Uh, then I sat down to try and record it, and man, did I run into a lot of issues. Um, I have a pretty nice um, microphone here. It's a Shure SM58. Sorry, just to show you guys, which is a, a decent microphone. Uh, one of my old bandmates said, if you can't make a, an SM58 sound good, you're <laughs> you've got bigger problems than your microphone. So, um, but the problem is, is that running that through my audio interface and into my um, computer here, which is a Chromebook, incidentally, um, it separated that um, channel into, that microphone into just the left audio channel. And using the camera software that I've been using, um, it just, it, I couldn't get it to play back on the left and right channels. It works fine when I'm in the digital audio workshop, just trying to record audio only. It plays fine on both channels. It records fine on both channels. Um, but uh, for the video, it did not work. And I was actually very disappointed to go back and look at my older songs and see that they had the same issue. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how I missed that on the playback, but uh, I did. Well, actually I do know, but it's technical minutia, so I won't bore you with it. But, um, yeah, it's been, um, trying to correct that was a problem. Fortunately, um, the microphone on my, uh, cell phone was decent enough to upload, uh, another version of the song. But it's not a long-term solution. So for right now, where I feel like the audio quality is not of the greatest import, I'm using this kind of USB, um, condenser mic. And I think it'll be okay. But in order to record um, some new songs, I'm going to have to find a some new solutions. So we'll see how it goes. You know, the problem was that, well, in a lot of things, let's say my reach exceeded my grasp. And um, what I was trying to do was film a video for YouTube um as well as record, let's say, recording quality audio, like album quality audio. Um, and uh, it was just too much to do at the same time. 
Um, not to say that people are not doing it, because there are some people I watch who do that all the time. Um, if you really want to see somebody play bazooki and make fine videos, uh, Tea and Barons um, is doing a fantastic job, and uh, I would love to do half of what he does, um, not only on his playing, but on his, his video production. But uh, that'll come with experience, I suppose. Um, and then um, another issue that I had in trying to, um, let's say, prepare for this video right now, not the recording of the song, is that I, um, after recording the song, kind of went down something of a historical rabbit hole. Um, I'm a big history nut. I love studying history and have for a long time. And uh, World War I, uh, the Great War, has a, a special place in my, um, how do I put it? It's, it's something that's always fascinated me, interested me. Um, I believe it's overshadowed by the Second World War um, unjustly. I think that the consequences of the Great War cannot be overstated. It was um, a catastrophe for everyone involved and uh, yeah, some sort of a morbid fascination with it. Um, but I didn't know a lot about the Dardanelles campaign, um, which is the subject of, of the song that we were, uh, that I recorded. Um, I didn't know a lot about it. Um, obviously I understood, I, I know where the Dardanelles are. They're, if you don't, you don't know much history. Um, and, and I knew that the Anzac troops participated, um, and I knew that it was, a, a, like everything else in the First World War, um, a disaster. Uh, but what I wanted to do was I, I kind of wanted to talk about it a little bit during this video. And I needed to brush up on, on it before I did. You can't sit here in front of the camera and talk about something that you don't really understand. So that process has taken me several days. Um, reading some books that I have here in the library, uh, in my bookshelf rather, um, listening to some uh, excellent history podcasts, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, and and then just reading online. You know, there's there's lots to be found online about it. Um, but I think that was another um, case of. Uh, my objectives were too grand and too varied, and again, my my uh, reach exceeded my grasp. Um, you know, I really had to ask myself, what are you doing here? Uh, are you really trying to make a history podcast in front of your camera to post on YouTube, or are you trying to record a few songs and, and you know, talk about it a bit? So that's where we are now. Um, I've learned a lot about um, the Gallipoli Peninsula and the Dardanelles campaign, um, but I don't think I'm going to share it all with you because it just seems inappropriate. I will, uh, I, I fear that I'm going to just bog these videos down in the mud and um, it's probably going to be best if we don't, if I don't. So. So, um, my kids have come downstairs now. Um, I decided to try to make this uh, video before they went to bed because there's not a lot of time left in the day after you get the kids tucked in and the story's read. So, um, yeah, we're just going to have to put up with the noise of a family kind of living around me. Uh, you know, two kids under six, my wife, my very large dog, uh, I don't think it'll detract too much from this video. Um, what we should talk about, actually, before we get into this tutorial, is the artist that wrote this song, um, Mr. Eric Bogle. Uh, I gotta be honest, I was shocked to learn that this was not a, a 
Clancy song, a Liam Clancy tune, um, or an older traditional tune to, to learn that this song had been written in the seventies by somebody who was not Liam Clancy. Uh, I couldn't have been more shocked if I learned that Stairway to Heaven was written by Jethro Tull. I really, it, it, I just took it for granted. Um, I said, uh, or at least I typed in the video description um, that I posted uh, for the song that this was the song that got me back into traditional music. Um, and it's very true, but it was the Liam Clancy recording that did. Um, I, I don't know how it would have come across my playlist. I was listening to a lot of, uh, of contemporary musicians at that time. And, um, somehow this song was played in front of me, uh, on, I guess, a random YouTube playlist or something. And I was astounded. It was not a song I had heard as a boy. Um, I mean, look, those of you that know Liam Clancy know he's such a phenomenal artist, such a phenomenal performer. Um, and the emotion that he sang the song with, the topic, the the beautiful acoustic guitar, I, it just, man, it brought me right back. And, and that was the beginning of me coming back into the... Uh, traditional fold I had listened to this music growing up as a child um, but you know when I kind of became an adolescent I wanted to rebel against my parents and my grandparents and got into I believe Metallica would have been one of the first bands that was like my band um, but yeah wow so uh, in preparation for, for recording the song, I listened to the Liam Clancy song uh, many, many, many times um, just to, to brush up on the, the music and the lyrics and so on. Um, and then after doing that for a couple of days, I, I decided to see who else had done versions of the song because it's always nice. You never know. Sometimes you, you come across... Uh, like Kate Rusby's uh, uh, Witch of the Westmoreland, like just such a different take on a song that you know and love, and sometimes it can be really good. And so I saw this guy, Eric Bogle, who I, I had never heard of before, had done a version of the song, and I listened to it, and I thought, wow, this is a fantastic version of the song. Um, and then, lo and behold, this is the guy that had written the song. Um, a Scot who had emigrated to Australia, um, traipsed around the outback and, and, uh, uh, ended up writing this song, um, I think it's something of a protest song during, it was during Vietnam, um, and so it wouldn't surprise me if that was his, um, objective there, if that's why he wrote it. But what a wonderful job. You can still find videos of him performing it, uh, performing that song um, today. I, I'm not sure when these videos were made, but they're very recent. And uh, wow, he, he performs it very well. Obviously, he wrote it. Um, yeah, uh, and then not only that, but I learned that he wrote the song um, The Flowers of the Forest, or I'm, I'm not that's not true. The Flowers of the Forest is, is a traditional tune. You'll often see this other song um, named Willie McBride. Um, the Green Fields of France, I believe, is, is probably uh, the correct title of the song. But he wrote that one too. Both fantastic songs, both performed impeccably by Liam Clancy and Tommy Makem. And uh, yeah, so like I say, I just took it for granted that those were the guys that had written the song. And, uh, but Mr. Bogle, if Mr. Bogle, if you ever see this, thank you, sir. You've given, uh, me anyways, a wonderful gift in writing those songs. So the family playing in the room next door to me was a, a little bit too much. I was, as is my want, overly ambitious when it came to, uh, <clears throat> my recording. So I decided to take a quick break. I went to the post office and I actually got a uh, new stand for my fiddle. 
so I could take it off one of the, the wall hangers and uh, free up one of those. And I got uh, over my shoulder here, you'll see a couple flags in the mail. Uh, anybody that watched the last video recognizes that the room looks a lot different than it did. Uh, I just, I thought if this is something I'm going to do, I'm going to want something more, um, less sterile than the blank white walls that we saw in here. And all I really did was put up an old poster, uh, that my wife wouldn't let me put upstairs anymore and, uh, uh, shifted some furniture around in here. So, uh. Anyways, um, back to it. Um, I mentioned a while ago that I um, listened to the song a lot on repeat. I spent a lot of time in my kitchen, and uh, we've got one of those speakers on the wall, and so I just had uh, the band played Waltzing Matilda on repeat. And given the uh, lockdown situation here in our community, um, the kids are home full-time, and my son spends a lot of time at the kitchen table doing his uh, his reading and his writing and his math work and stuff like that. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the song is, is playing there over and over and over. I mean, that's my way. I listen to a song on repeat for hours, days, days, um, just until it's ingrained, until it's it's tattooed on my soul and I don't need to think about it to play it I I just yeah but the drawback in this case is that um, the line I wished I were dead um, played several times and my son uh, the precocious youngster that he is um, asked some pretty difficult questions um, and uh, so we had uh, we had a fairly uncomfortable conversation about it, about war, which is something that uh, he's, at five years old, not been exposed to, mercifully. Um, and, you know, in trying to answer his questions, you're sitting there at the table across from a five-year-old and he's asking these very probing questions and, and, you know, in a flash, I just, saw that every soldier on on both sides of any conflict you know begins as somebody's five-year-old sitting at the table and it's just a heartbreak i mean it it war is a catastrophe for all players on all sides you don't win wars um we we glorify it in our media and um, in our songs. We'll sing songs. I'll sing songs for you that, um, you know, trivialize war, paint it in a positive light. But you can never forget, never forget that it's a, it's a disaster. Complete and utter disaster. And is something to be avoided at all costs. Speaking of complete and utter disasters, um, we should just very briefly touch on the Dardanelles campaign and the experience of the Anzac troopers, um, as that is the subject matter of the song. And in order to do um, a song as powerful as this justice, I believe you owe it to your audience and yourself to... Uh, have some understanding of of what what you're singing about so um in the uh war the western front in europe uh, france and belgium had calcified um the lines were set almost in the the as they would be till the end of the war and so in British circles, um, people were casting about for a way to um, pressure the Germans, uh, or I should say pressure the Central Powers um, elsewhere, as things were not going well um, in Europe. So the um, 
a campaign was uh, imagined uh, on the Gallipoli Peninsula to put pressure on the Ottoman Empire, which would hopefully relieve pressure from the uh, Tsarist Russia. And um, uh, eventually what was conceived was a purely naval operation. Um, Winston Churchill was the uh, First Lord of the Admiralty at the time, and he uh, and others had this plan to send some old um, battleships that were not of high enough quality to be used against the German high seas fleet um, in a mission to force the Straits. Um, these are very famous, very, very famous uh, straits leading into the Sea of Marmara and thence to Constantinople, uh, modern Istanbul. Um, but the naval campaign was a disaster um, and eventually it was realized that um, in order to have any sort of a, a lasting um, in fact, um, ground troops were going to need to be involved. And for this, um, several uh, British uh, units, and most famously the Anzac uh, troops, that's Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, so the troops from uh, uh, that part of the world, Oceania, I'm not certain how I would describe that geographic locale, but uh, the Australians and the New Zealands, the Aussies and the Kiwis. By the way, is Kiwis uh, like a word I shouldn't be saying if I'm not a Kiwi? Is that offensive? Anyways, um, these men were uh, at that time stationed in Egypt to complete their training. They were very raw recruits. Um, they were seen as... as uh, at least having the potential to be very good soldiers as they had a high degree of athleticism, um, stamina, endurance, I guess from traipsing around the, the outback. Uh, I'm not sure why they had such a reputation, but they certainly did. But they were very green. And um, um, some landings were planned. Um, in a part of the world that, to be honest, I'm a guy that spends a lot of time humping tent and pegs in a pack, and the geography was such that I wouldn't want to hike it on a good day, never mind try to force a landing on this rocky, sheer peninsula with small, small beaches. Um, and anyways, some beachheads were established uh, the Anzac troops entrenched British troops as well at the um, end at the tip of the peninsula Cape Hellas um, and the Anzacs famously in what is now today called Anzac Cove and they spent a miserable miserable summer there fighting attacking defending making very little gains um the smell of the battlefield, uh, the battlefield could be smelt miles out to sea. Uh, it was so powerful that the Red Cross and the Red Crescent arranged a ceasefire for both uh, belligerents to collect and, and bury their bodies. And, you know, it, it calls to mind the, the Christmas truce uh, with the Germans in 1914, where you know, men that even minutes, hours before this had been trying to kill each other were now exchanging cigarettes and belt buckles. Uh, yeah, it, it it's one of those things. <clears throat> and anyways, uh, as it says in the song, uh, you, we buried ours and the Turks buried theirs and it started all over again. And it did. It did. They buried the bodies and uh, retreated to their trenches and went back to it. Later, in August, um, the British... Uh, I should mention the French were there as well, by the way. Um, but the, the British planned their final offensive, um, which, like everything else, was a catastrophe. Um, the Anzac troopers performed very well under the circumstances and actually made some gains that 
were probably harder to hold than their original positions and really did nothing to change the greater strategic um, situation on the ground. Well, actually, the strategic situation uh, changed such that the British determined that uh, continuing the campaign was untenable. And they made plans to evacuate the troops, which, um, by all accounts, was the best planned part of the entire campaign. It's, it's actually fascinating. I really encourage you to... Um, well, I'm going to post um, at least uh, some reference to the uh, podcasts that I listen to. Um, and I, I really encourage you to give it a listen. I really do. It's, again, it's not about glorifying war, but um, sometimes what people, human beings, are capable of is, is f fantastic. It's so inspiring. Um, and if nothing else about the Gallipoli campaign, um, the, the Dardanelles campaign, is inspiring, um, the evacuation was. It really must have been. It was ingenious. And it was executed uh, brilliantly and got the boys out of there. It, um, the campaign was, um, I've seen it referred to as the crucible of nations. Um, and it, it was, let's say, the formative experience for both the Australian and New Zealand national consciousness, as I understand it, not being an Aussie or a Kiwi. Um, and as well, the Turks who are, um, you know, it's really easy in the English speaking world um, to forget about the Turks or um, almost make them a character, Johnny Turk, as it were. But, you know, they're humans as well. They were then and they are now. And it was their um, national awakening as well under uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He was a fascinating man, uh, very well respected. Um, and it also, let's say, gave birth to the modern state of Turkey as well. Um, after the conflict, um, the uh, Australians, at least, and the Turks, um, let's say the relations between the two countries um, normalized and in Canberra there is a war memorial um, for obviously the Anzac troopers but the Turks as well there is a Kemal Ataturk um, statue there and um, there's a quote inscribed on on the memorial that's attributed to Mustafa Kemal and um, it's actually so wonderful that I, I just copied it down um, from uh, the computer and I wanted to read it out right now uh, it's pretty short those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country therefore rest in peace your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace after having lost their lives on this land they have become our sons as well And if there is anything um, about war that is, is worth glorifying, it is this common thread that I find where soldiers recognize their fraternity with the men on the other side of no man's land from them and realize that they are all humans in a very, very unfortunate circumstance. I think uh, I'll give that a listen, and if it's uh, acceptable, we'll move in to the song, to the tutorial. If I can find my mouse. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I had originally tried to record the song on the uh, Godin up there on the wall, um, and just wasn't in love, just wasn't feeling it, so here we are under the bazooki now. Also, 
Um, I would like to point out... Sorry, I would like to point out that uh, that will be the last performance with the original strings. I finally got uh, some new strings from Beats and Bites, St. John, New Brunswick. Thank you, Mr. Bites. Uh, so I'll change those uh, if I, well, as soon as I work up the courage. Uh, I really, restringing instruments is, you know, you got to do it, but it's not a lot of fun. And the number of strings only multiplies the not a lot of fun. Um, what I did for the song was um, pretty basic finger picking, which I'll show you because uh, as soon as you can get the um, that pattern down, it really never changes. It doesn't need to change anyways. I mean, I did change it up a little bit with some hammers and stuff, some ornamentation, but you really don't need to. And as a matter of fact, if you don't like that finger picking, you can just strum it. Um, again, if you remember, it's about playing to the best of your abilities, not to the best of someone else's abilities. You, you always want to try to um, push yourself, for sure. You want to improve, but, um, you know, don't let your level of skill today, um, you know, stop you from enjoying the music. So, um... Actually, I should have uh, made sure that this was tuned before we started, so I'll just do that really quickly, uh, just in case anybody wants to play along. So, see you in a second. So, what I did was I, I um, tuned the uh, bazooki here to standard bazooki Irish tuning, which is G, D, A, D, and then I put the capo on. And uh, so that takes my strings from G, D, A, D to uh, C, G, D, G, uh, tonally lowest to highest. Um, once again, that's uh, C, G, D, G now. And um, what I did was I tuned the Zuki with the capo off, so just here at the, the nut, and um, once I was satisfied with that, I put the capo on, and then I tuned it again. So what's happening here is I'm just making fine adjustments to make certain that um, I, I'm actually tuned now to G, to the key of G, which we'll be playing in. Um, and uh, the reason I do that is sometimes based on the placement of your capo or uh, just the quality of the construction of your instrument, um, the intonation might be a little bit off. And I really don't care anymore what the tuning is like up here. I won't be playing any of that. We won't hear it. What I want to do is make sure that it's tuned from here down fine, um, which it is. I'm not certain the wisdom of um, drastically increasing or decreasing the um, tension with the capo on. I've done it lots um, in my life, but I'm not sure if that's good for the strings, if it's good for the mechanism. Um, so what I would advise you to do is just uh, tune it um, open, place your capo, and then just make fine adjustments to make sure that you're all in tune. Um, yeah, and then we can go ahead to the song. Um, I will switch to the other, um, camera, and I'll just show you the chords that we're going to go through, um, for the tune. So, um, let's take a quick look at the chords. I'm really going to try and get through this properly this time, because, uh, this is take number 10 or 12. Um... But it's very straightforward. We only need four chords, okay? Regardless of which key you would like to play this in, we're going to need the root, or the first. We're going to need the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. The first, fourth, and fifth are all major chords, and the sixth will be a minor chord. So let's look at that now. Um, the first, the root, is G. We're in the key of G, so our root must be G. And we're going to, the first G we can find is here on the seventh fret of the C string. Um, it would naturally be the 12th fret, as you can see by the dots, but with reference to the capo, it's our 7th, so I will just strum this out. Sounds good. The next chord that we're going to want is going to be our 4th, which is the C chord. The C chord I will get here. I'm depressing the 2nd 
fret on the D string and strumming the rest open. And that gives us our C chord. The fifth is going to be a D. And we will find that by depressing these two frets here, the second fret on the C and the second fret on the first G. And uh, we'll play that for you now. You will often see this fifth uh, chord played by depressing this fret as well. So that's the second on the other G. But um, because I like to have that open G here to drone on while I'm picking the song, um, and because the capo kind of cramps up my hand a little bit, uh, it, it takes away the space I have to work, uh, we're going to omit this fret right here. Um, and then the final chord we're going to need is the E minor, our sixth fret. And we find that by depressing the fourth fret right here and the second fret on the D string. So that's the fourth on the C and the second on the D and it gives us our minor chord. Now um, I'll stop it and we're going to take a look at the picking pattern next. <clears throat> For the picking uh, that you saw, um, I'll try to maybe hold the bazooki up like this so you can kind of see or uh, might have to change the angle a little bit. Um, but uh, just a note on playing, I found that the bazooki did not sound very loudly when I was finger picking. Um, that is uh, probably because of the nature of the bazooki and the double courses of strings. Um, it also is likely because I um, was not using finger picks. Um, I, I've actually, since recording the song, gone out and ordered a um, just a cheapy set of finger picks to practice with. Um, but what happened was, because the volume was not very loud, I actually had to lower my um, volume when I was singing. And so the whole recording ended, out, uh, ended up coming out a little bit lower than I would have liked. Um, but anyways, we're not going to worry about that now. If you're a really ambitious uh, picker, you could try to pick this out, but that's way beyond my picking abilities, which maybe I'll talk about more on another day. But right now, um, the timing of this song, by the way, is in 3-4. Um, but so the same as the swallowtail, but unlike the swallowtail, uh, where it was one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, um, this one is going to have more of a one and two and three and kind of uh, rhythm to it. Um, let's just see. I'm going to, although you can't see what this hand is doing up here, I'm just going to make my root chord and uh, I'll try and pick it out here. So basically, you can do that, um, keep up that picking pattern for the whole song. You're just going to be changing your chords up here with your left hand and trying to maintain that as, uh, just as, as best as you can. Um, if you listen to my recording, you'll know that I did... Um, uh, I added a lot of ornamentation, well not a lot, I added some hammer-ons and pull-offs for a bit of ornamentation, um, but I, I don't want to get kind of mired in that. Um, I, I'm just going to explain the chord progression through the song. Um, you know how to make all the chords now, you know the finger-picking pattern, and if you want to experiment adding the ornamentation, maybe you can watch my video of the recording, or just play around and try to see if you can figure out when I was adding those hammer-ons. Um, it was fairly arbitrary when I would hammer, when I would pull off. Uh, you know, that's just, you worry about that. You try to figure that out on your own. I believe you can still play this song well without trying to add that ornamentation. Um, so, I'll just go through, let's say, the first handful of chord changes with that picking pattern so that you can see what's happening, listen to the changes, and kind of keep an eye on my fingers. I'll actually turn it like this as I feel you can more easily see what's happening with my fingers here. 
So. There. Pretty straightforward, right? That was the, uh, the first four chord changes, and you'll notice that I never changed my, my picking pattern. One and two and three and one and two and three and one and two and three and one and two and three and. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now, um, let's take a look at the actual chord progression. Okay, let's go through the A part now. Um, the song is broken into an A, B, C part, which repeat, uh, if you go through that one time per verse, and then when you move to the next verse, A, B, C again, until you get to the very end of the song, um, and uh, you get to the Waltzing Matilda part, which is um, t entirely different. It's got a different time signature. Uh, the, the chords are the same, but I don't pick it at that point in time. I'm, I'm more strumming it. Um, Lastly as well, I'm going to omit any ornamentation. Um, you can get that from watching the other video. Uh, but otherwise, I just want to illustrate the chord progressions using my one and two and three and uh, pattern, okay? Um, the chords I'm gonna go through, I'll, I'll write them up here. And uh, we're going to be going uh, from root to fourth root to sixth, root to fifth, root, root, okay? Uh, again, it should be over here already, but that's root, fourth, root, sixth, root, fifth, root, root. And um, you're going to repeat that again. The entire A part is are those eight bars repeated. Okay, so let's uh, see how it works out for us. Uh, you won't be able to see this hand. Uh, you don't need to. It's just it's doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And you're going to focus on these chord changes here. By the way, usually we're going to pick out two full one and two and three ends on the root as an intro. We're going to do that twice on the intro. So root root we're going to start now root fourth root six root five root 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 four root six root five that's it. That's your A part. Go ahead and pause it, practice it. Um, uh, let me actually go through one more time slowly for you guys. Root four. and then repeat it. So just go ahead, uh, pause it, take it slow, work on that one and two and three and uh, work on your chord changes and I will see you in a couple minutes for part B. <clears throat> okay, for the B part. Um, the B part has a bit of repetition as well, um, but, um, well, I'll explain it to you. We're gonna do fifth, fifth, fourth, root, then fifth, fifth, fourth, root. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the last eight me, uh, bars from our A part and we're going to tack them on here at the end of the B part. So then that's your uh, root, fourth, root, sixth, root, fifth, root, root. Okay, maybe it'll make more sense um, if I pick it out here. So we just finished the A part and now we're moving into five, five, four, root, 
five, five, four, root, root, four, root, six, root, five, root, root. And once slowly now. Five, five, four, root, five, five, four, root, root, four, root, six, root, five, root. Give that a try now. Take it slow, practice those chord changes, and uh, I'll see you in just a moment for part C. Okay, so the C part now. Um, this is going to go root. This is a, a bit of a different one, so I'll try to go through this slowly, but it's root, fourth, root, root. Then it goes root, fourth, fifth, fifth, fourth, fourth, root, fourth, root, fifth, root, root. Let's hear what it sounds like. One more time slowly. One. Root. Fourth. Fifth. Fifth. Fourth. Fourth. Root. Fourth. Root. Fifth. That's your C part, okay? So you'll go A part, B part, C part, and then back to your A part again until you get to the final verse, which is the one about the old men um, on parade. Uh, when I was a... Uh, well, now every April I sit on my porch is how it begins. So you're going to finish that final verse, and then at the end of that verse... There's going to be quite a change, and uh, we'll talk about that in the very next part. So take your C part, practice it slowly, S practice your transitioning from the A part to the B part to the C part, and, uh, and then when you're ready for that, we'll examine the very final piece of the song. Okay, so for the final part of the song, the D part, Waltzing Matilda, Waltzing Matilda, who will come a Waltzing Matilda with me, um, no new chord shapes. We're just going to be using the first, the fourth, and the fifth for this. And the timing has changed now from 3-4 to 4-4. Four, four. Um, because we won't be picking this out, that's not going to be um, that big a deal for us. But your the rhythm that's happening in your mind up here needs to shift and listen the best way to understand that shift is to listen to the song over and over and over and over until it's just you know that that switch comes logically and naturally for you <clears throat> um, when I did play this part of the tune I did a bit of um, picking and strumming here
but I would not say that that's necessary, and I think it sounds just as good if you... So, let's not sweat it. Um, you can, if your musicality allows, you want to work in a bit of picking there, good for you. Otherwise, don't sweat it, just strum it. Um, also, if you've been finger picking up until now, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Whoops, that's probably effed up. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to then go fumbling around for a pick or, you know, take the pick out of your mouth. Well, you can't really do that if you're singing the whole tune. So let's not worry about it. We're going to strum with just the backs of our nails like I've been doing for 20 years, and it should sound fine. Um, so I'll just go through the progression for you. Root. Uh, four, four, root, four, root, five, root, five, root, four, root, four, five, root. It's probably going to be the easiest part of the song for you to learn but I think it adds a lot to the song to have that um, at the end of the tune there so just you know you've got part A now you've got part B now part C you've got them all tied together what you need to just work on now is transitioning kind of smoothly from part C to this outro to this part D and uh, that's the last piece of the puzzle okay that's it that's the progression that's the video i gotta wrap this thing up because uh it's not getting any shorter um i hope again that the video is helpful i hope that somebody out there teaches themselves this song from watching my video if one person does that it will have been worthwhile for me um also maybe somebody learned a little bit about the experiences of the anzac troopers um I certainly did. Um, I introduced myself to Eric Bogle, as I said, who, um, although I have yet to explore even half of his um, his repertoire, um, I'm really excited. It's kind of, this is the problem when you listen to trad music, you know, it's not like these guys are getting any younger and putting out new music for the most part. So when you discover um, an older artist that was previously unknown to you, it's, it's kind of like a brand new band on the scene, even if his songs were recorded 50 years ago. Um, <clears throat> before I go, though, um, I just want to show you on the guitar here, just in case, just a second, just in case anybody wanted to try to play this on the guitar, because... You know, probably more listeners are going to have a guitar kicking around in the house than they are an Irish bazooki up there. Uh, and this song is totally, I mean, very playable on the guitar. I believe both Eric Bogle and uh, Liam Clancy um, picked this out on the guitar. Uh, you can do it in a, a finger-picking way, you know, your root, your G. One and two and three. And then the progression is the same. It doesn't even matter what key. If you just pay attention to my root, fourth, fifth, sixth, well, you can slide it around to any key you like as long as you know what the root, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth of that key are. <clears throat> Basically, you're... it doesn't matter what key the song is written in. You want a capo for your own voice um, or for the sake of your buddies. If you've got a friend who's a fiddler, uh, and you start, you know, learning songs in whatever, F sharp, they're probably not going to be too thrilled with you. It's just not convenient. So, you know, if you're playing in D major, G major, E minor, that that's all pretty good for, for bass, for your average traditional uh, musician. Um, but mostly, you're probably going to be playing by yourself. You want to play something that can, uh, in a key that, that you sing well. Don't be afraid to try to change your register when it comes to singing. I believe for sure that you can push your voice up, you can push your voice down. Um, I'm not, man, uh, the vocals, 
these are not ever going to be vocal tutorials. Singing is something that I think I do well enough, but how or why, I have no idea. Singing to myself, by myself, all the time, in my truck, in the shower, in all, all the time. All the time I sing to myself. Um, you know, maybe that's the key. But uh, as I say, uh, voice lessons, these will never, ever be. But on the guitar, you know, root, fourth, root, sixth, root, fifth, root, root. And that's your A part, you know, and like I say, you can work on a picking pattern. You'll figure it out if you want to. Very easily playable on the guitar. Um, and a last note on the progression. I hope that's the correct progression. I mean, it's what I played to sing the song. If you listen to another recording, it might be subtly different. Um, but, you know, that's it. That's as good as I can, I, I can figure it out. And as I say, I think it's good enough. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I do intend to make more of these, uh, and maybe someday, years from now, some young lad is going to turn on YouTube and, and find these videos and, and he'll be able to get a, uh, a whole traditional music repertoire out of it with the lessons and the history in the background. And he can go on to, uh, wow, some pubs and bars and, and, uh, you know, coffee houses like, uh, I don't have the opportunity to do anymore. So, thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you next time. So, whoa.